Now meet Miguel Co, Manoha Kiatani, and Andrew Lim, who sat down for a chat with Mr. Lee about several strategic transformations he helmed after becoming CEO. When I first took over, Andrew and I tried to make appointments to see investors. Investors were not so keen to meet us. It was quite demoralizing. Yeah, it took a while for us to convince. So we said that, well, we really needed to transform the, the company. And the Sanders Singh Bridge was a right fit because it helped us to deepen our development capabilities and also help us to bulk up on the asset management side of the business. And doing a merger is never about putting two companies together, it's about people, it's about organisation, it's about changes in reporting line. We thought it's a, a, a great marriage. You're giving the asset classes, uh, which we are strong in being, uh, we being ASB in, a, uh, in industrial, and marry with uh, capital land that's strong in retail and strong in, in commercial lodging. So we thought on the business side, it make a pretty perfect fit. But of course, on our side, we were concerned about the people. So I think we really made sure that we treated the people, you know, in a very fair and respectful manner. And I think because of this uh, good relationship that we developed, we were able to, you know, uh, successfully integrate the two companies within a, a very short period of time. It was the biggest uh, transaction in Asia. It's about $11 billion, Singapore dollars transaction uh, that year, 2019. And uh, the deal allows really us for to go forward with the next restructuring, which happened uh, last year. If we had not merged with Ascenders, mm -hmm. I think what happened to us in COVID would have been a lot harder for us as yeah. Capital Land, mm -hmm. because you brought a very resilient, a very uh, forward-looking real estate business in new economy in India, giving us better balance, better calibration, and that allowed us to navigate COVID much more confidently uh, with better resources at hand to weather the uncertainties. The share price of Capital was doing quite well uh, going into early 2020. Mm. In fact, we had the belief that you know, if we continue to execute what we wanted to do, we could even breach the NAV level. You know, we were all charging ahead and COVID hit us early end January. So I still remember during Chinese New Year second day, I went to go and buy masks from uh, our, one of the factory, you know, hoping to give it to our China colleagues to bring across. And over the next few weeks, things just became worse and worse. Uh, and then led to China lockdown, and then Singapore lockdown. At that point in time, I mean, there were people being hospitalised. Uh, we started to, to get worried. The management and the board all felt that the most important thing to do is to make sure that, you know, uh, health, safety, well-being of our people, our customers, our stakeholders are the most important thing. If you lose money, I think you can always make better money. But if you lose a life, then it's totally irreplaceable. The guiding principle is that the safety of our staff and our tenants is paramount and we should just do the best that we can do and, and learn along the way. I think we have managed it reasonably well but it was a baptism of fire. This was during the darkest days when we weren't sure what was going on, but China was completely locked down and you were having a briefing on level 24. Our senior management team uh, who were looking after China, but happened to be in Singapore, were making arrangements to fly back. They were determined to go because as being good leaders and of teams, they wanted to be on the ground with their, with their guys. He couldn't go because he needed to be here, uh, making sure the, the ship uh, continued to run smoothly. Uh, and I think it was Tsang. Tsang was going to go. I could tell that you were very conflicted. and You knew that Tsang had to go because it was the right thing for a leader to do. But at the same time, uh, you, it was really upsetting you that you could not go with him. Uh, and, and you got quite emotional in the room. And it was at, during that time where we all did not know what was going on. There was no roadmap, there was no light, but yet we had to get business done, we had to look after our people, we had to put people on the ground in the right places. And we came out of it with a renewed sense of being a senior team and a renewed sense of purpose. 
So you could see that uh, in Singapore and many other markets where Kaplan is, uh, has a presence, we do a lot of uh, great things for the community to ensure that we play more than our part to uh, ensure that wherever we do business, we are helping the people going through this very difficult uh, time period. Chikun asked us to get involved in the building of temporary accommodation, safely bringing in migrant workers from overseas location to Singapore. It had nothing directly to do with capital then, but we felt that we had to do it as part of the philosophy that we don't only have to do well, we have to do right and we have to do good by our community. It actually helped to facilitate the integration between the ascenders and the, and the capital and folks because we really had a common adversary which was uh, COVID-19 and everybody just had to, had to work together. And remember when he presented a proposal to ask all the senior management of the company uh, to take a salary cut and I know how hard they've been working during that uh, time period. So I joked with him, I said, Chi Kung, remember, this is the year you're going to be working the hardest, but taking home the least. So uh, he just nodded and said, uh, that's part of the job. When we merged the two companies together, the concern was about making sure that, you know, we can carry everybody along safely. Because if you were to run the company down, we will affect not just 16,000 people, but if you include the family members, there's about at least 70,000 people. The restructuring thinking really only started when things didn't look so bleak. Man. I mean, when China started to reopen and, and Singapore started to, to reopen, at one point the share price was trading almost at least a 50% discount to, to NEF. And we just didn't believe that uh, even after COVID, you know, we could get the share price close to anywhere, close to NAV. And that's why we decided that uh, we wanted to restructure the company to accelerate the split between the asset management company and the development company. I remember we had that several discussions amongst the, the management and all agreed then before we went to the board. From the board's uh, vantage point, uh, there ought to be at least three things uh, required from Chi Kung and the management team. One is that we had to be believe in the management team. The team has, has credibility with us. And the second point is the, the, the proposal has to have very sound strategic uh, rationale. And the third one really is we need to be convinced that it's the right timing because we are trying to manage the pandemic at, the, uh, at that time. And the question really is going to be how we're going to come out the crisis stronger as versus how we're going to be status quo after the crisis. Sitting here today, we created another additional uh, $10 billion of, uh, uh, of uh, shareholders' value. So that's a, a very strong uh, statement that, uh, that it was a good uh, restructuring to benefit uh, the shareholders. And the staff themselves are happy. They are more focused, they're doing the things uh, they are best in. And uh, I think it's again a win-win-win kind of uh, uh, restructuring. Undertaking such a major restructuring in the midst of COVID is really a very uh, laudable achievement, you know, about not letting a crisis go to waste. I think that was also the time where we decided that we had to put in more efforts in the area of sustainability, innovation, digitalization, and we actually put a lot of focus on that, you know, to also be a, a kind of an ambidextrous organization which not only looks at the short term, but also prepares itself for the, for the long term. One of the key things that we also wanted to do right is that even as we split, that the ecosystem remains intact, you know, and a lot of effort actually, I think, went into that. And that is critical because that differentiates even CLI as an investment manager. Yeah. I don't think any other investment manager can boast of such an ecosystem. If you think about the restructuring, it was uh, the, the idea sounds simple, right? It's just taking a company private and then doing the relisting of the CLI. But the relisting itself, there was no book building. I mean, we actually have no idea how the share price was uh, going to look like on the day when the gong was being hit. Coming through the merger, navigating through COVID successfully, um, and then with this restructuring. Shareholders now um, don't flinch when we bring ideas to them. They, they look at the management team under Chikun with um, belief that we walk the talk. Uh, that fills us with confidence as well, but also equally the responsibility of execution. You need people to, to, to come together thinking about how, what's the implication to the organisation, how we should organise ourselves, how we should restructure, how we should communicate, not just subsequently to the investors, but how do we explain to the 
colleagues about a change it requires a lot of uh, of commitment at that senior at the senior team level and then subsequently how do we bring the leaders along in the right broader community and of course not to forget the communication with the board now as we uh, Brian be a global real estate investment manager one of the things that he has put into place is we got to look and feel the way we want to act and we want to position ourselves these are cultural uh, barriers that we are knocking down uh, moving from a, a, a place of comfort into something that is also unknown for us you know, we'll probably make a few mistakes along the way but i think it's absolutely critical again that we do this we are evolving ourselves from a corporation in multiple locations to really a truly multinational corporation you know by bringing in more diversity by having people with different experiences join the team and i think all these are very important building blocks for us to really become a global investment manager it's very difficult to keep doing the same things and expect a different outcome so if you want something new you have to try to do something that you have never done before it's always about the people it's about always about the team any organization is only as good as the people that we can have really very uh, optimistic about the future of uh, uh, capital land investment but we do have a clear vision we have good people we have the right values uh, it's a competitive market out there uh, but i think we do have certain comparative advantages and unique strengths uh, in particular being a Asia focused investment manager with a global mindset. Speaking for the board of directors, we are very, very positive uh, to work this uh, group of management at this time. We are not a finished article. Uh, I think there is a great possibility uh, for, for the company to be truly globally uh, competitive. We have a strong, steady balance sheet. The team is now a lot more global. Hierarchy is flat. People feel comfortable to interact and to disagree. And I feel that there's an important culture that we need to allow us to navigate the, the choppy waters so that we continue to hear different perspectives and, and allow us to walk a lot with a lot greater confidence as we continue to journey ahead as we pursue growth.